we're broadcasting now. All right, so this is the Sunday morning that we begin our reading through Pilgrim's Progress. And I want to start by giving a bit of uh, introduction. So you can see, what is it here? It's about 10 minutes uh, our time until 10. And um, uh, because we listen to Kevin, at a, we start that about 9.35 and leading us in music. So if you're following us online, then that's kind of the, the program. You can watch him about, if you tune in about 9.30, 9.35, then he leads the music, and then we switch over to this live stream. And um, as I mentioned to our class here earlier, that um, we're, we're broadcasting this on Sermon Audio, uh, Light for Dark Times page, and then also on um, um, Facebook, same title, and I'll put it on YouTube then this afternoon so that everybody can follow along. All right, Pilgrim's Progress. Well, let's have a little bit of introduction, and if you if you watch that video by Derek Thomas, then um, you you this will be a bit of, of repetition here. But John Bunyan lived in England in the 1600s, all right, 17th century. Uh, he was born 1620, something like that, and in, in that era. He lived until he was, uh, he died when he was 60 years old, and it was rather unexpected when he, when he died because he had uh, <clears throat> preached, and I think he had ridden through a, some storm or rain, and he got so anyway, he caught pneumonia, and in those days, if you know pneumonia, you didn't have any penicillin or anything to take so um, so he died when he was about sixty. his um, growing up, of course, he grew up in a non Christian family. his father was what they called a tinker, and his Derek Thomas mentioned in that introductory video, nowadays, if your frying pan starts sticking, you throw it in the garbage and go to Walmart and get another one, right? So, uh, but in those days, <clears throat> if something went wrong with your pots and pans and, uh, and you needed repair, you, you called a, a tinker and he came and, and so that's what his dad did. And then ultimately that's the trade that John Bunyan picked up as well. Uh, his mother died and then his father remarried in like two months and, and he, there's some indication he didn't get along. There was some stress there between him and his stepmother. So he took off and joined the army. And when he was 16, lied about his age. And, and uh, at that time, you know, the English Civil War was going on. And that was between the parliamentary forces and the king's forces. And the king, I think what he's Charles I, right? He was anti Protestant and somewhat of a tyrant. And the parliamentary forces won that civil war. And that's when Oliver Cromwell came in and so on. They lopped off Charles I's head and uh and then Parliament and the, let's see, what was, uh, what was Oliver Cromwell called? The Protector. He, he didn't, they wanted to make him king, but, but he refused. So um, um, ultimately, after 10 years or so, you know, the Charles II came in and all of those reforms were, were taken away. And that's when uh, Bunyan, who he was a Baptist and he was not a member of the uh, you know, he'd become a Christian by then. And he was preaching, and um, they arrested him for preaching. He wasn't part of the Church of England. He wasn't licensed to preach. So uh, they put him in prison, and he was in prison for 12 years, and then subsequently another six-month stint then um, as well. And so you can find out more details about his imprisonment uh, if you read some biographies. Um, what did I skip? How he came to Christ. 
that you can, if you want all the details, you can read his own account of it, which is kind of an autobiography, uh, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. And that's well worth reading um, because, um, and it helps you understand Pilgrim's Progress because um, in Pilgrim's Progress, it seems like it takes an awful long time for the main character, Christian, to get the sin burden off of his back, you know. And, and so some people have uh, criticized Bunyan for that, or why didn't he have the sin c- come off sooner? Uh, and, and, uh, but, but if you read Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, you find out that, that Bunyan coming to Christ and the way that the Lord worked in his life was a long process. It was over a, a, a period of, uh, of years. And that happens with some, with, with some Christians. In fact, a lot of the Christians that, that we read, you know, Bunyan, George Whitfield, the Wesleys, um, it, um, Charles Spurgeon in ways, it, it didn't happen uh, instantaneously, right? I mean, when it happened, the regeneration is instantaneous. But anyway, he tells the account. And um, he said that he, he learned to cuss and swear from his dad. And in fact, he was noted for his cussing and swearing uh, in, in the community, so much so that when this lady, who was no model of saintliness whatsoever at all, uh, heard him swearing, okay, she, she rebuked him. She wasn't a Christian, but she rebuked him for his swearing. And that, that convicted him some, and that conviction stayed on for a while. But he would do things. He'd go through periods of time when he, you know, that would happen. He'd come under conviction, and then he'd fig, he figured, well, at one point, uh, well, I'm going to hell, I may as well party on, on the way, because that's the only enjoyment I'm going to get. You know, that was the stuff that was going through his, his head. And then, uh, and then one day, he's walking along the street, I don't know, going about his tinker business, and he overheard these ladies sitting on the porch uh, steps talking among themselves. And they were talking about things that he didn't know anything about. They were talking about Christ, and they were talking about the new birth and how Christ had graciously uh, brought them to salvation. And in ways, that was probably the first time that... And that, this, had a real, this had a real impact on him. And, uh, and ultimately then, down the road, the Lord led... Bunyan, he had him connect with a, a guy that was a preacher named John Gifford, I think was his name, and he helped disciple and teach John Bunyan. Um, in fact, I think a couple of the characters in Pilgrim's Progress, they believe are really are meant to represent uh, John John Gifford, maybe evangelist or, or some of those some of those characters. Um, Bunyan struggled for a long time um, over Esau because in Hebrews you read about how Esau was reprobate. He, uh, you know, he sought for repentance, but it was impossible for him. He had crossed the line, and the Lord handed him over, and, and uh, even though he sought for it with tears, well, his, his motives certainly still weren't, weren't good. But, but Bunyan was under a lot of conviction that he had been such a sinner and that he had, he had relapsed. You know, he had seemed like he would make a profession of Christ. One, in fact, at, at one point in his life, he cleaned up his act, but he was not born again yet. He was not regenerate. But um, his r- transformation to holiness was so apparent 
that he, I mean, he totally quit cussing. Um, he was in, in church, and it just had a real impact on the people that knew him. And they were all talking about how godly he had. He, had, he was just the finest Christian in, in town. But, but Bunyan said that he, he wasn't saved. He, he wasn't saved at all. And he was looking, he was dealing with Mount Sinai. He, he was trusting in his own righteousness and, and uh, he, he was not, he still was not born again. And ultimately, he relapsed then. And, uh, and, and that's what caused him such great conviction um, that, that perhaps he'd committed the unpardonable sin and so on. And, and so he really kept struggling. It took him a long time before the Lord brought him over that, and, and he finally is, is born again. He, now, this is rather amazing. He had a very uh, minimal education. He did learn to read and write in school, but uh, he, uh, he joined a Baptist church, and over time, the people there began to realize that he was gifted to preach. By, by the Lord, and he began to have opportunity there in the church, and, and, and he, he preached. And uh, Oh, and I was going to mention, too, when he was in that era back when he was, had cleaned up his act, you know, but he wasn't saved, and he was just relying on his works. He, he tells in, in Grace Abounding, he tells about how he could talk up a theological storm, you know, he could do that. And, and sure enough, in Pilgrim's Progress, you'll meet a character named Talkative. And that's what he describes. So when he's describing how he was in that state, Talkative, you know, talk, 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 talk about theology, but he, he, wasn't, born, he wasn't born again. Um, so he preaches for a while, ends up getting arrested because he refused to, to cease preaching. And obviously, it's just an effort to silence the gospel. And he, and he is put then in, um, in prison. So, and it's in prison that he writes Pilgrim's Progress. And, and uh, John Bunyan was, um, I don't know if it's accurate to say he was a genius, but he was a remarkable person. When you read, um, so his, the works of John Bunyan, um, this is just one volume of three volume set, okay? And, and I don't know, you probably can't see it online, but the print is very small, okay? And you read, you read him and, and you can understand why John Owen who had been, I think, wasn't he Oliver Cromwell's chaplain or something? At any rate, John Owen, you know, who wrote, well, the works of John Owen is just about stretched to the length of this table. Um, and he's very meticulous. And, and, uh, but he told the king one time that he said, um, he was talking about Bunyan, and the king was kind of, mocking him a bit about, you know, why are you talking about this tinker? And Owen told the king, he said, um, I would gladly give up. What was he? What did he say he would give up? I forgot. I think Thomas mentions it in that. So he, he, would, he would gladly give up. Basically, it was all of his achievements for, for the Lord, if he if he could preach one sermon like John Bunyan preaches, and John Bunyan became very well known. I mean, large crowds of people came and heard him. So he's an example of Christ raising up a, a, a preacher to praise His name from a rock. You know, that, that's that's what Bunyan is an is an example of. And what's amazing to me is still, it's, this stuff still amazes me, but 
in seminary and so forth. They, they never even, never even deal. You know, if a person, you're going to be a pastor or anybody, and you want to learn to preach, start reading Bunyan's sermons. And, and, uh, and you begin to, to see. Um, but anyway, he's so largely ignored. This um, book here is uh, a biography, autobiography, actually, of J.C. Ryle, okay? So he lived in the 1800s. You've heard me quote him a lot, and we've read his stuff. And, and uh, I, uh, I mentioned this book because, and I can't, here again, you probably can't see it, but if you get this book, there's got a bunch of pictures in it here, okay, of J.C. Ryle and his family, and they're dressed up, for example, they would dress up like the characters in Pilgrim's Progress, and they, I imagine they put on little skits and so forth, so, so here he is um, reading a book, and this is J.C. Ryle, he's, he's got a fake beard on, and, and it's, uh, he's posing as Christian, reading his Bible, and then um, there's another one here of where his one of his daughters, I think, is answering a door, and it they're they're uh, playing out uh, Christian knocking at the gate and being welcomed at the palace, beautiful by piety, and so and anyway, Pilgrim's Progress has had an immense effect on, and what Derek Thomas mentioned is that. Um, He's afraid that this generation might be the generation that forgets Pilgrim's Progress, which is a, a disaster, you know. So that's why he says, all of you who haven't read Pilgrim's Progress are criminals, you know. So, so uh, we, need to, we need to read it. So, All right, well, I've just skimmed over some, some of the facts of his biography, but that gives you a, a good introduction so let's pray then and commit this study to the Lord father we thank you for your blessing of, of raising up people like Bunyan down through the the centuries um, and and through them we that we might be able to to grow in Christ and even hear, hear the gospel in the in the first place and we pray, Lord, that as we go through Pilgrim's Progress now that you would bless this study and this reading and that, and that we would see that the Christian life following Christ is a battle. There are, and there are few that find it and persevere in it. And... Uh, and that there are many, many enemies to be met with along the way, and also uh, the many helps that you send to us to encourage us and keep us on that narrow path. And so, Father, we, we commit this study to you and, and ask that you would, you would bless it to your glory, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so I'm reading from this same one that Derek Thomas recommended, the version. There's lots of, well, I won't say version. There's editions, all right? And as long as you stick with an edition, a copy that is in the Old English, I think you'll be able to follow along uh, pretty well here. There's some that are modern English that, you know, they've tried to make it uh, more understandable for kids and so on. But I think we're better off staying with the, uh, the old one. I think we can handle these and thous and, and, uh, and so forth. So it begins with, it says, by the way, part one here, and most editions have part two. Part two is, he wrote later, it's the account of Christian's wife, Christiana, and her four children finally leaving the city of destruction and and heading off to the celestial city. So, um, but it begins, part one begins with what he called, what's called the author's Bunyan's apology for his book. 
he was criticized by arrogant academics and people for using the, uh, the medium of an allegory. All right? That's what Pilgrim's Progress is. It's an allegory. It's largely an, a biography of Pilgrim's experience in coming to Christ, but it's, or uh, Bunyan's, but it's, uh, it's also an allegory where kind of like a, a parable. Um, uh, but, uh, or, you know, all those words you can get mixed up. Allegory, metaphor, a simile, and all, all those things that they're not, they're not identical, but um, and in an allegory, there's lots of symbolism. Things represent real things, okay? So anyway, so here he's giving his defense I was going to skip over this, but eh, I don't think Bunyan would want us to skip over it. So let's take a look here. And he, he does it in, in prose, or kind of in rhymes and poems and so on. When at the first I took my pen in hand, thus for to write, I did not understand that I at all should make a little book in such a mode. Nay, I had undertook to make another, which, when almost done, before I was aware, I this begun. So he, he, he says, I, I'm gonna, I started to write. I didn't even have in my mind the full picture. I didn't, he didn't intend to write Pilgrim's Progress, but he started to write. And thus it was, I, writing of the way and race of saints, in this our gospel day, fell suddenly into an allegory about their journey and the way to glory. In more than 20 things which I set down, this, oh, I, I, that was a comma, in more than 20 things which I set down, this done, I 20 more had in my brain, <laughs> his crown, right? 20 more came. And they again began to multiply like sparks that from the coals of fire do fly. Nay, then thought I, if that you breed so fast, right, so many words, right, I'll put you by yourselves, lest you at last should prove ad infinitum and eat out the book that I already am about. So he, he was going to write one book, and then he, he got going on this, and he was ignoring the other one. And, and uh, so he said, I'll, I'll just set it aside, but apparently he couldn't. Well, so I did, but yet I did not think to show to all the world my pen and ink. He, he never wrote this to be published. He didn't have that in mind. In such a mode, I only thought to make, I, I knew not what, nor did I undertake thereby to please my neighbor. No, not I. I did it my own self to gratify. And he's in prison while he's doing this. Neither did I but vacant seasons spend in this my scribble, nor did I intend but to divert myself in doing this from worser thoughts which make me do amiss. Thus I set pen to paper with delight and quickly had my thoughts in black and white. For having now my method by the end, still as I pulled it came and so I penned it down until it came at last to be, for length and breadth, the bigness which you see. The whole book, there it was. Well, when I had thus put mine ends together, I showed them others, he showed them to others, that I might see whether they would condemn them or them justify. And some said, let them live, and some let them die. Some said, John, print it. Others said, not so. Some said it might do good. And others said, no. Now, now was I in a strait and did not see which was the best thing to be done by me. At last I thought, since you are thus divided, I print it will. And so the case decided, right? And nobody can agree, but some... Well, why not, why not have it printed then? For thought I, some I see would 
have it done, though others in that channel do not run, to prove then who advised for the best, who was right. Thus I thought fit to put it to the test. Isn't that interesting? If he'd have listened to the naysayers, it never would have, that would have been the end of it right there. I further thought if now I did deny those that would have it, thus to gratify, I did not know, but hinder them I might of that which would to them be great delight. For those which were not for its coming forth, for those who are against publishing it, I said to them, offend you, I am loath. He's not trying to offend them. Yet, since your brethren pleased with it be, forbear to judge till you do further see. If, thou, if that thou wilt not read, let it alone. Some love the meat, some love to pick the bone, yea, that I might them better palliate. Make less severe, severe, all right. I did too with them, thus expostulate. So he's trying to, he's telling them, I'm not doing this to just be in your face, and I don't want to offend you, but just be patient. You know, there's some people that get angry if they give you advice and you don't take it, right? So, may I not write in such a style as this? In such a method too, and yet not miss my end, his purpose? Thy good, your good, all right? Why may it not be done? <clears throat> Dark clouds bring waters when the bright bring none. Yea, dark or bright, if their silver drops cause to descend the earth by yielding crops, gives praise to both. And carpeth, I think that means complain, not at either. But treasures up the fruit they yield together. Yea, so co-mixes both that in, her, that in her fruit none can distinguish this from that. They suit her well when hungry, but if she be full, she spews out both and makes their blessings null. You, you see, the, what he's starting to do here is, see, the, the main criticism that he was being hammered at was uh, <clears throat> you can't write in this style to teach God's truth. Okay, you can't do it. Well, immediately Jesus' parables come to mind. You know, I mean, he, he did this, but you see the ways the fisherman does take to catch the fish. What engines, what tools does he make? Behold how he engageth all his wits, also his snares, lines, angles, not sure, angler, angles, hooks and nets, yet fish there be that neither hook nor line nor snare nor net nor engine can make thine, they can't be caught by them. They must be groped for and be tickled too, or they will not be catched, whatever you do. And what he's talking about here, I think, is that why not use every means, proper means like this, to present the gospel to people if, if, it'll, get their, if it'll get their attention, right? How, how does, that's, that was the fisherman, how does the fowler <clears throat> seek to catch his game, birds? By diverse means, all, all which one cannot name. His guns, his nets, his lime twigs, I don't know what that is, light and bell, he creeps, he goes, he stands, yea, who can tell of all his postures? Yet there's none of these will make him master of what fowls he please. Yea, he must pipe and whistle to catch this. Yet if he does so, that bird he will miss. If that, if that a pearl may be in a toad's head dwell, there must be some story about a pearl in a toad somewhere that I don't know about it, but... And, and it may be found, too, in an oyster shell. If things that promise nothing do contain, what better is than gold who will disdain? That have an inkling of it, there to look, 
that they may find it? Now, my little book, though void of all these paintings, illustrations, that may make it, that may make it with this or the other man to take, is not without those things that do excel. What do in brave but empty notions dwell? Well, yet I am not fully satisfied that this your book will stand when soundly tried. That's his critic. Why, what's the matter? It's dark. What of it, I think he means. What though? But it's feigned. He's like, well, what of that? I trow, I trust some men by feigned words as dark as mine make truth to spangle and its rays to shine. But they want solidness. This is his critics, you know. The whole issue is that they don't like his method. Speak, man, thy mind, they drown the weak. Metaphors make us blind, right? Jesus purposely spoke in parables so that um, hard-hearted, unbelieving people could not hear, all right? All right, that's why he was doing it. And solidity indeed becomes the pen of him that writeth things to divine to men, things divine to men, but must I needs want solidness? I think solidness he's talking about plainness, you know, use plain words, not allegory. But must I needs want solidness because by metaphors I speak? Were not God's laws, his gospel laws, in olden times held forth by types, shadows, and metaphors? Yet loath will any sober man be to find fault with them, lest he be found for to assault the highest wisdom. No, he rather stoops and seeks to find out what by pins and loops, by, I don't know all these uh, phrases, by calves and sheep, by heifers and by rams. Oh, so these are symbols in the types in the Old Testament. And he's saying God uses all kinds of symbols and types and metaphors in the Old Testament to represent things, calves and sheep heifers and by rams, birds and herbs and by the blood of lambs. God speaks to him. And happy is he that finds the light and grace that in them be. Be not too forward, therefore, to conclude that I want lack solidness, that I am rude, ignorant, right? All things solid in show, not solid be. Things that can look like truth but they're not truth. All things in parables despise not we, lest things most hurtful lightly we receive. And things that good are of our souls bereave. My dark and cloudy words, his allegory, they do but hold the truth as cabinets in case enclose the gold. The prophets used much by metaphors to set forth truth. Yea, whoso considers Christ, his apostles too shall plainly see that truths to this day in such mantles, such forms be. Am I afraid to say that holy writ, holy scripture, which for its style and phrase puts down all wit, I'm not sure what that is, is everywhere so full of all these things, Dark figures, allegories, yet there springs from that same book that luster and those rays of light that turn our darkest nights to days. Come, let my critic, my carper, to his life now look and find there darker lines than in my book he findeth any. Yea, and let him know that in his best things there are worse lines too. May we but stand before impartial men to his poor one, I dare adventure ten, that they will take my meaning in these lines far better than his lies in silver shrines. Come, truth, although in swaddling clouts, must be close, 
I find, informs the judgment, rectifies the mind, pleases the understanding, makes the will submit the memory to it does fill. It does fill with what doth our imaginations please. Likewise, it tends our troubles to appease. Sound words I know. Timothy is to use and old wives' fables he is to refuse. But yet, grave Paul, him nowhere did forbid the use of parables in which lay hid that gold, those pearls and precious stones that were worth digging for, and that with greatest care. Let me add one word more. One thing you'll find out about Bunyan, if you read his sermons and stuff, he'll say one word more, or I shall strive to limit myself. And then he's just pages and pages and pages follow. But let me add one word more, O man of God. Art thou offended? Dost thou wish I had put forth my matter in another dress, in another form? Or that I had in things been more express, more plain? Three things let me propound. Then I submit to those that are my betters as is fit. One, I find not that I am denied the use of this my method. So I know abuse, put on the words, things, readers, or be rude in handling figure or similitude and application, but all that I may seek the advance of truth this or that way. Denied, did I say? Nay, I have leave, I have permission. Example two, and that from them that have God better pleased by their words or ways than any man that breatheth nowadays, thus to express my mind, thus to declare things unto thee that excellentest are. Second, I find that men, as high as trees, will write dialogue-wise, yet no man doth them slight for writing so. Indeed, if they abuse truth, cursed be they, and the craft they use to that intent but yet let the truth be free to make her sallies upon me and thee. Don't worry if you don't under, you know, This would take a lot of study to figure out every, every line here, but you get the point. He's addressing his critics and he's defending his method. Which way it pleases God for who knows how better than he that taught us first to plow to guide our mind and pens for his design. And he makes base things usher in divine. I find that holy writ, scripture, in many places has, has semblance, resemblance with this method, where the cases do call for one thing to set forth another. Use it I may then, and yet nothing smother truth's golden beams, nay, by this method may make it cast forth it rays, its rays as light as day. And now, before I do put up my pen, I'll show the profit of my book and then commit both thee and it unto that hand that pulls the strong down and makes weak ones stand. This book, <clears throat> it chalk, chalketh out before thine eyes the man that seeks the everlasting prize. He's talking about what Pilgrim Progress is about, okay? It... it Chalks on it draws for you, picture in words, before your eyes, the man that seeks the everlasting prize, salvation. It shows you whence he comes, where he came from, and whither he goes, where he's going. What he leaves undone, also what he does. It also shows you how he runs and runs till he unto the gate of glory comes. It shows, too, who set out for life amain, as if the lasting crown they would obtain. Here also you may see the reason why they lose their labor, and like fools die, why people who start out professing Christ, and, but they don't persevere. This book will make a traveler of, of thee, 
if by its counsel thou wilt rule be. It will direct thee to the holy land, if thou wilt its directions understand. Yea, it will make the slothful active be, the slothful Christian, spur him on. The blind also, delightful things to see. Art thou for something rare and profitable? Are you for something rare and profitable? Would you see a truth within a fable? Art thou forgetful? Would you remember from New Year's Day to the last of December? Then read my fancies. They will stick like burrs and may be to the helpless comforters. He's saying the images and the characters and the symbols that he uses will stick in a person's mind and be useful. This book is writ, written in such a dialect as may the minds of listless men affect. It seems a novelty, and yet contains nothing but sound and honest gospel strains. Would, would you di divert yourself from melancholy? Wouldst thou be pleasant, yet be far from folly? Wouldst thou read riddles in their explanation, or else be drowned in thy contemplation? Dost thou love picking meat? He used that before. Detail. Or, or wouldst thou see a man in the clouds and hear him speak to thee? Wouldst thou be in a dream and yet not sleep? Or wouldst thou in a moment laugh and weep? Wouldst thou lose thyself and catch no harm and find thyself again without a charm? Wouldst read thyself and read thou knowest not what and yet know whether thou art blessed or not? by reading the same lines. Oh, then, come hither and lay my book, thy head and heart together. Anyway, okay, so we've read his apology. The book itself is easier going uh, than that, but, um, but there it is. It's amazing how many people... Um, there will always be people, and, and the book starts off this way, there will always be people who... Their mission in life, and they might, lots of them will claim to be Christians when they're not. When somebody is coming to Christ, or maybe they're a new Christian, right? To come to Christ, there will always be people trying to discourage you from following Christ. Always. And you can, you can, uh, you can expect it. So some of the, um, strongest opposition that I had and Verla shared in that too really uh, you know basically my my dad and uh, he basically said when I was leaving the sheriff's office and to become a pastor that that was stupid you know and he's a professor he was claimed to be a Christian anyway there's always people like that around okay here we go the pilgrim's progress in the similitude of a dream, right? Uh, this, these are great words. These are classic words, you know. This is, uh, this is equivalent, the opening here. This is equivalent with like, uh, it was the best of times and the worst of times. Who wrote that? Was that Dickens? Who wrote that? Dickens, anyway. All right. As I walked through the wilderness of this world, I lighted on a certain place where was a den, and that's his prison cell. And I laid me down in that place to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed, and behold, I saw a man clothed with rags, standing in a certain place with his face from, away from his own house. And here, I love this line, a book in his hand and a great burden on his back. I looked and saw him open the book and read therein. And as he read, he wept and trembled and not being able longer to contain, he broke out, he broke out with a lamentable cry saying, what shall I do? That kind of harkens to the Philippian jailer. You know, what, what, what must I do to be saved? In this plight, therefore, he went home and refrained himself as long as he could, 
that his wife and children should not perceive his distress. But he could not be silent long, because that his trouble increased. Wherefore, at length, he broke his mind. He, he opened his mind to his wife and children. And thus he began to talk to them. Oh, my dear wife, said he, and you, the children of my bowels, I, your dear friend, am in myself undone by reason of a burden that lieth hard upon me. Moreover, I am for certain informed that this, our city, will be burned with fire from heaven in which fearful overthrow both myself with thee my wife and you my sweet babes shall miserably come to ruin except the way yet I see not except some way of escape can be found where my, whereby we may be delivered. Um, <clears throat> the city is called, as you'll see, it's called the city of destruction. On the painting up here that's in the lower left corner there that's where he's going to start out and each one of this thing illustrates each scene that we come across in in pilgrim's progress if you have the edition of this book it's it see it has it there on the on the cover you can find it online too and, and follow it at this his relations his family were sore amazed not because they believed that which he had said to them was true. You know, they weren't shocked. That he, they didn't believe that the city of destruction was the city of destruction, right? But they were sore amazed, but because they thought some frenzy distemper had got into his head. Some of you have experienced that from family. You're, he's, he's crazy. He's gone crazy. He's got religion, you know. Therefore... It drawing towards night, and they hoping that sleep might, I love these, this is why I like the old version, that sleep might settle his brains. With all haste they got him to bed. But the night was as troublesome to him as the day, wherefore instead of sleeping he spent it in sighs and tears. So when the morning was come, they would know how he did. He told them, Worse and worse, he also set to talking to them again, but they began to be hardened. They also thought to drive away his distemper by harsh and surly carriages toward him. They were like criticizing, telling me he's crazy, I guess. Sometimes they would deride, sometimes they would chide, sometimes they would quite neglect him. Wherefore, he began to retire himself to his chamber, to his room, to pray for and pity them, and also to condole his own misery. He would also walk solitarily alone in the fields, sometimes reading, sometimes praying, and thus for some days he spent his time. Now I saw upon a time when he was walking in the fields that he was, as he was wont, as was usual with him, or as he desired to do, Reading in his book, and what's the book? It's the Bible, right? And greatly distressed in his mind. And as he read, he burst out as he had done before, crying, What shall I do to be saved? I saw also that he looked this way and that way as if he would run. Yet he stood still because, as I perceived, he couldn't tell which way to go. I looked then. And saw a man named Evangelist coming to him who asked, Wherefore dost thou cry? What's wrong? He answered, Sir, I perceive by the book in my hand that I am condemned to die, and after that come to judgment. And I, I like this line here. And I find that I'm not willing to do the first. I don't want to die. Nor able to do the second. I'm not, if I come into judgment, I'm headed for hell. Christian no sooner leaves the world. Sometimes there's these little uh, 
poems he sticks in here. Christian no sooner leaves the world but meets evangel. Oh, this is just a commentary. But meets evangelist who lovingly greets him with tidings of another and does show him how to mount <coughs> to that from this below. Then said evangelist, why not willing to die? Since this life is attended with so many evils. The man answered, Christian answered, because I fear that this burden that's upon my back will sink me lower than the grave and I shall fall into Tophet, hell. And sir, if I be not fit to go to prison, I am not fit, I'm sure, to go to judgment and from thence to execution. And the thoughts of these things make me cry. <coughs> then said evangelist, if this be your condition, why are you standing still? Why standest thou still? What are you, how come you're standing here? He answered, because I know not where to go. Then he, evangelist, gave him a parchment roll, and there was written within, flee from the wrath to come. The man therefore read it. And looking upon evangelists very carefully said, where must I fly? Then said evangelist, pointing with his finger over a very wide field, do you see yonder wicked gate? The man said, no. See, he, he can't even see Christ yet. He didn't. Then said the other, do you see yonder shining light? He said, I think so. Then said Evangelist, keep that light in your eye and go up directly there too. So shalt thou see the gate at which when thou knockest, it shall be told thee what thou shalt do. So I saw in my dream that the man began to run. Now he had not run far from his own door, but his wife and children perceiving it began to cry after him, to return. But the man put his fingers in his ears and ran on crying, life, life, eternal life. So he looked not behind him, but fled towards the middle of the plain. Jesus makes it plain over and over and over again. You've seen it. You've experienced it. One of the chief obstacles to following Christ is those people that are closest to you, family, friends, and, and so on, to try to, to, to keep you back. And that's why Jesus warns of it so often. Um, yeah. <clears throat> the neighbors also came out to see him run. And as he ran, some mocked, others threatened, and some cried after him to return. And among those that did so, there were two that resolved to fetch him back by force. You see, what, what motivates these guys? What do they care, right? Well, they don't want to see anybody else saved. They're going to hell and everybody better go with them, right? So, uh, so now you're going to meet obstinate and pliable. All right, here we go. The name of the one was obstinate stubborn and the name of the other pliable now by this time the man was got a good distance from them but however they were resolved to pursue him which they did and in a little time they overtook him then said the man neighbors wherefore are ye come they said to persuade you to go back with us but he said that can by no means be you dwell said he in the city of destruction the place also where i was born by the way, what is the city of destruction? The world. It's the world. It's the world, right? I see it to be so, and dying there, sooner or later you will sink lower than the grave into a place that burns with fire and brimstone. Be content, good neighbors, and go along with me. What said obstinate? And leave our friends and our comforts behind us? Yes, said Christian. For that was his name. Okay, so now we, we know his name is Christian, you know, right? This is right. Because that, uh, that all which you forsake is not worthy to be compared 
with a little of that which I'm seeking to enjoy. And if you will go along with me and hold it, you shall fare as I myself, for there where I go is enough to spare. Come away and prove my words. Obstinate. What are the, thing, what are the things you seek since you leave all the world to find them? I seek an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away. And it's laid up in heaven and safe there to be bestowed at the time appointed on them that diligently seek it. Read it so, if you will, in my book. Tush, said Obstinate, away with your book. Will you go back with us or no? No, not I, said the other, because I've laid my hand to the plow. You see, all these references, allusions to scripture. If you set your hand to the plow, you're not fit for the kingdom of God if you look, if you look back, right? So, obstinate, come then, neighbor pliable, let's turn again and go home without him. There's a company of these crazy-headed, I bet Ann looked this up, coxcombs. I think I did at one point. We'll have to see if we can figure that out. So, anyway, he's a, these I've you know, it's like I've seen these guys with crazy-headed coxcombs that when they take a fancy by the end are wiser in their own eyes than seven men that can render a reason. Then said Pliable, don't revile. To, he says that to Obson. If what the good Christian says is true, the things he looks after are better than ours. My heart inclines to go with my neighbor. What? More fools still. Be ruled by me. I say, do what I say, pliable, and go back. Who knows whether such a brain-sick fellow will lead you. Go back. Go back and be wise. Anyway, I think we'll stop right there for now, but uh, we'll pick up next time. But pliable does go with him. Obstinate goes back. But as you can probably figure out from the name pliable... <coughs> He is easily influenced one way or the other, and he is not going to uh, persevere. So. A coxcomb is a vain and conceited man. A coxcomb is a vain and conceited man. All right. So there's obstinate accusing Christian of being that. So, All right. Well, we'll pick up there next time. I have two more copies of this version uh, coming and I'll bring them next time if somebody needs one then so all right there you have it